Mrs. Barry, it is 6 p.m. and uh, we're ready to get started. Thank you. The Clarksville Montgomery County study session is called to order. Ms. Thank you, ma'am. The, the first item on the agenda this evening uh, is the the uh, the MOU between C CMCEA and uh, and CMCSS. Um, at this time, uh, be glad to to answer any questions that um, that you might have uh, in reference to uh, this item as it reads on the agenda. Um, Mrs. Of course, Janine Johnson uh, heads up our, our team uh, that, that really moves forward to, uh, to support a memorandum of, of understanding uh, in, this, uh, in this particular area. And uh, I'll ask Janine to, to join me. Uh, there she is. And, uh, and talk a little bit about the MOU. Okay, hey, great. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. House. Good evening, board members. Um, um, I'm pleased to let you all know that this is our eighth year that we have successfully uh, implemented a memorandum of understanding through the collaborative conferencing process. A management team uh, is made up of seven administrators representing the Board of Education, and there are also seven teachers from CMCEA that represent the educators of the district. Uh, we met seven times this year, five of those meetings being in person, and the last two meetings be, uh, we conducted via Zoom, and those meetings went from October through May. The actual MOU document will be placed on the CMCSS website with hyperlinks referencing all policies and procedures that are part of the understanding. Um, and David has uh, placed this up here, and you all should have a copy. Of course, right now it's not linked yet because it has not been approved, but You'll see as David uh, scrolls through here, we have a table of contents with the, the different articles. And then again, each policy or procedure that's referenced is listed in the MOU. And uh, the teachers can go on there and then they can uh, click on whichever area they're interested in and it will lead them directly to the policy and procedure that is online. So this year, um, we did have a few areas that we did revise. Um, Hello, everyone. Uh, the first one being um, a policy in regards to grievances, and in this one we talked about, uh, the, we added the fact that if a teacher is uh, requesting to do a grievance process, and this is between themselves and their principal, that um, the uh, a professional organization representative can be can attend the meeting and we do ask that they provide us at least five days notice of that and we are calling this a um, instead of a conference we're calling this a resolution meeting so that was that policy was updated for this year and then also um, we did update the personal leave option and that's something that we uh, worked on right at the end of the school year um, and this allowed employees who have used none of their personal leave, instead of taking payment for a day, they could roll um, their days over to sick leave, but then re receive an additional personal leave day for next year. And um, normally we, the, not all, but a but large percentage of our, uh, of our teachers do use up their personal leave. And we've always had an option where if they didn't use all three of their personal leave days, they could have payment for one day and then the other days would roll to their sick leave. Well, this year with us ending the school year as we did in March, we had a large percentage of our employees that still had all three of their personal leave days. So in an effort to help with the cost of that, we did um, indicate that if you, if you choose not to take the payment, then um, we will give you an extra personal leave day for this next year. So that was something that we worked through collaborative conferencing and we did come up with that agreement and we did offer that to our employees. And then there was one other revision to our dress code policy. It was a small revision. Um, we did add in um, information about um, visible tattoos that would be considered obscene, profane, or provocative. And we did indicate that um, employees would be required to work with their supervisor to ensure that those tattoos are covered at all times so that they are not a distraction at, in the uh, school environment. And then we also added uh, links for all of our um, medical insurance and our dental insurance uh, as an option for our, um, the, the teachers to be able to see those as a part of their MOU, although that information is already on the website. And then, of course, the teacher salary schedule is um, a part of the MOU, and we've got that right there. David's just moved to there. And as a reminder that there, there, is, there are no COLAs or steps for this year 
but there is a one-time payment of $300 that will be paid to any employee that was previously with us last year and is with us this year. And that's all I have for the MOU. And once that's approved uh, through these next two meetings, then we will place it on the website and we will have it hyperlinked. So uh, conveniently, our teachers can review that at any time. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson. Uh, uh, be glad to entertain any questions from board members uh, at this time. Um, seeing none, we'll move on to the next item. And, and just as a reminder, uh, that I failed to, to do before the meeting started. Uh, we will ask uh, those of you uh, that haven't shared video as of yet to, to share video just for security purposes and us knowing who's in the meeting. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our professional development update. Uh, and I'll uh, ask our, our Director of uh, Professional Development, uh, Tina Smith, to, uh, to join me at this time uh, for this presentation. Tina? Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me tonight. I'm gonna take a few moments to walk you through some highlights of professional learning. So as Mr. House said, my name is Tina Smith. I'm the Director of Professional Learning. Um, I wanna start off by giving you some highlights from the 2019 school year of the work that was accomplished. So I wanna start off by um, talking about our certified employees. Um, so if we look at our certified employees as a whole, during the 1920 school year, they earned over 72,000 hours of in-service credit. Um, so that averages out to be about 27 hours per person, which is well over what the state asks us to acquire each year. In addition to the in-service hours, they received over 63,000 hours of training credit as well. So that averages out to about another 24 hours per person. So it is definite that um, teachers are receiving a lot of professional learning within the district, but the goal is not just to receive professional learning. We want that professional learning to be quality and to meet their needs. So when we look at some of the input from the teachers, um, those responding to the survey, 98% of them indicated that the professional learning activities, that's what the PLA stands for, that they participated in met their intended learning goals. And in addition to that, the goal of professional learning is to be able to then go back and put that new learning into practice in the classrooms. And so 97% of the teachers either agreed or strongly agreed that they could use that learning to enhance key areas of their professional practice in their classrooms. Now, one of the places that the teachers acquire a lot of their professional learning is through our Engage Professional Learning Conference each summer. So I wanna take a look back at the conference from the 1920 school year. So we had 455 unique courses that were offered that year. So over 900 different classes that teachers could take. And that's where they earned a little over 22,000 hours of their in-service credit this past year. But the great thing to highlight about Engage is the fact that teachers not only um, learn from district leaders and professionals, they also learn by other teachers all throughout the district. So we have teachers that step up to share those amazing best practices that they have tried out in their classrooms throughout the year and found to be successful so that those can spread to other educators as well. Now, another area that we worked to um, increase and enhance during the 1920 school year was um, our online professional learning activities. And so 97% of teachers agreed or strongly agreed that this format was beneficial in meeting their professional learning needs. So in addition to the normal online classes that we provide, we also did something new this year, um, offering a webinar series to employees. So this was a great way that they could hop on a session similar to this and learn some new information or to dig in a little deeper in an area of interest. And these webinars were open when appropriate to both um, certified employees and classified employees as well. So that leads me into the next area that I would like to highlight, and that is the professional learning from our classified employees, because that's another area that we're working to enhance and provide more learning opportunities to our classified employees as well, not just the teachers in the district. So in the 1920 school year, our classified employees were able to earn over 22,000 hours of training credit, which um, equaled about 11 hours a piece. We were very proud of that. And to highlight a couple of areas, 
Um, one that was new last year that we had not been able to provide in the past was a full orientation for our educational assistants hired in. That was something that we had not been able to do before that point. So last year they had a face-to-face -face session at the beginning of the year and we followed that up with some additional online resources to um, continue to support their learning as well. Um, something else to highlight is we're also trying to very strategically work with departments in the district as well. So a couple of areas to highlight. We partnered with our human resources department this past year um, for a few different things. You can see um, information here about a retreat. So that is, it, it sounds like something fun, but <laughs> that's when we come together to increase our skill sets. And so we were able to um, help them with some new um, practices to help streamline some of their areas. Um, and when this whole COVID pandemic came around, um, it, it forced us all into learning some new skill sets. And so we were able to partner with Human Resources to provide our first ever virtual job fair along with a new process to onboard new employees virtually as well. Um, we also worked with student services this past year to help build some resources around truancy um, to help out our parents and their understandings too. So in addition to focusing on some highlights from the 1920 school year, I really want to take a moment to focus in on the 2021 school year as well. So what are we doing to prepare ourselves for this year that's coming up? I mentioned our Engage conference from 1920, and right about the time that this whole COVID pandemic hit, we were getting ready to um, putting the final touches on our Engage conference for the 2020 school year. Uh, we were about to release the catalog for teachers to start registering for classes when um, school had to release in March. So with that came a very quick realization that we were going to have to go back and re-examine what the professional learning needs were of the educators in the district. Um, because now it looks very different than it looked when we first um, determine those professional learning needs at the beginning of the 1920 school year and when teachers first submitted to um, present at the conference all the way back in December. So um, we knew we needed to narrow our focus because there was this new skill set that teachers were going to have to acquire to be prepared for the 2021 school year. So we narrowed our offerings. We didn't wanna overwhelm teachers with too many choices um, when we knew everybody was gonna need this new skill set. So we narrowed down to sessions that were aligned to moving our strategic work forward. And then we set out to build this new pathway of learning to help teachers build this essential skill set. So while this pathway looks different for different grade levels, different content areas, this gives you a, an idea of what a basic path will look like. So we have a course around best practices to help teachers transition those practices that they know work so well in their classrooms to now how do I do that if I'm not face to face with students every day if we're in a remote learning situation how do I apply those same best practices in a new way in this new format. I know you've heard Mr. House mention the school's PLP platform before, so we have a few classes to help teachers learn how to utilize this new platform appropriately as well. So there is a 101 class where they're first introduced to the platform and the purpose behind it and the functionality. Then a 102 follows that up, a 102 course where they can dig in and learn how to utilize their individual courses and um, customize courses as well. And then we follow that up with a 103 course around differentiation and accessibility. So again, this is the idea of taking what we know are those best practices already and learning how to make those things happen inside this new platform and this new learning um, situation. So those classes are being offered during Engage and following up Engage as well. And the critical part of this is that we know learning doesn't just happen in a one-stop setting, that it's gonna be critical that they have continued support and follow-up as they're implementing all of this new learning for these skill sets. So that's where our technology integration coaches come in and are gonna be so beneficial. They were integral in helping to design and they're gonna be teaching these classes, but they're also gonna be there to support teachers as they're working towards that implementation as well. So the graphic that you see here to the right gives you a highlight of just what that support might look like. This is some data from the 1920 school year again. 
um, they were a little hesitant at sharing these numbers just because we, we cut off counting these numbers back in March and it doesn't show a full school year. But you can see um, there were over 800 times where they sat in and worked with teachers in grade level or uh, content area collaboration so that they could plan um, to implement this new learning right off the bat in their plans. There were over 2000 instances where they sat down and worked with teachers one on one to help implement um, new strategies in their classrooms. There were over 300 sessions where they either modeled a lesson for a teacher or co taught a lesson with a teacher to help them implement a new strategy. And there were over 50 sessions where they sat down with a teacher to develop some long term goals and had coaching cycles throughout the year to help um, teachers work towards accomplishing those goals. So that's just some of the ideas of how that support works and how we um, plan to help teachers continue that support as they're implementing these new skill sets that they're going to need when we walk into the 2021 school year. So those are just a few highlights of what professional learning looked like in 1920 and what we're doing to gear up for the 2021 school year as well. Thank you, Tina. Um, board members, uh, if you have any questions at this time, feel free to, uh, to ask them. Uh, if not, uh, we'd be glad to, to move on to, to item number three. Item number three is a budget amendment resolution uh, for 2020-21. And uh, I'm gonna invite uh, my chief financial officer, uh, Marsha Demers, to, uh, to join me to, to walk through uh, this specific uh, budget amendment. All right, thank you, Mr. House. Good evening, board. Um, so we have a, just a couple items on the budget amendment for this evening. Um, the first item, if you will look in the third column there where it shows proposed increase and decrease, um, those are the, that's the column that will show everything that we're amending. Um, so this first one is an amendment on our uh, basic education, our BEP funds. Um, on June 18th, the state uh, passed their final, the, did a final passing of the budget. Um, and in that, they had made a change. Originally, they, they had put 2%, a 2% salary increase in for teachers. And um, with looking at their budgets and readjusting, that was something that they did take out of their budget. Um, and so on June 29th, they sent us a new um, BEP estimate, and it was a reduction of $2,059,000. So we're showing that here. Um, and that's based on the state adjusting their budget for BEP. So that's a total there uh, reduction of uh, $2,059,000 in the revenues. And then uh, scrolling on down here. So um, in uh, the equipment account here that shows under human resources, we have some equipment um, that is allocated for our safety department. Um, and in preparation for the 2021 school year and trying to prepare for expenses that we may incur with uh, COVID-19, um, we are moving some of those funds to a new object code. Um, and if David will scroll on down to the next couple of pages, the state has actually set up a uh, new functional uh, expense category uh, specifically for COVID-19. And so we're moving those expenses there um, to the 72901 uh, function area, um, also increasing it with 40,000 that we are pulling out of our uh, fund balance. Um, we will still be in excess of the 3% there. Um, going down, you'll see that 40,000 coming out of the fund balance line item there, uh, leaving us uh, 9,298,623 in our fund balance. And then for the reduction with the BEP, we are uh, adjusting our uh, technology purchases and lease uh, reserve there, uh, 2,059,000 to uh, show a, a reserve of 2,421,000 to balance out that budget. I'll be happy to answer any questions. This is Charlie. Um, yes. Has, has the state authorized or given us any um, revenue for the virus yet? We have received, um, so the state has the ESSER, um, which is part of the CARES Act funds, and that is some funding that we have received from the state and um, are, are using that to, to focus on uh, kind of the learning loss um, that we're prepared for that. And somebody, Sean or Mr. House, may be able to speak a little bit more. Um, and Charlie, uh, 
in, in just just a little bit during my uh, uh, my comments under other business, I'll share with you that that, that Governor Governor Lee did just make an announcement um, earlier today or late yesterday uh, around. Uh, so I'll, I'll actually have a depiction to show you guys what that looks like. We don't know the details, being that it's just happened, uh, but it is specifically uh, for coronavirus relief uh, uh, for the state of Tennessee and public education. Uh, and I'll share that here, in, like I said, in just a little bit. And, uh, the CARES Act money um, focused on after school um, support, it focused on uh, expanding our school's PLP that Tina Smith just talked about, uh, focused on uh, our textbook adoption of ELA for quality resources. Is any of that money coming from the federal government, Ms. Harris? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, actually a majority of it. The, the money that was just announced um, uh, yesterday or today uh, is definitely federal, federal uh, that, as well as the money that, uh, that Dr. Imperatrice just mentioned uh, all of it is is uh, our federal dollars, um, specifically around the CARES Act, uh, as well as the Corona coronavirus relief. Is there any way that we can use any of that money to make hotspots out of buses, the COVID money? So we're we're actually working now um, with uh, you know with our patrons. Uh, we're we're looking at hotspots versus the idea of uh, of making buses hot. Uh, we've used hotspots for the last couple years, and that has seemed to be a, a good fit for our students as we practice our one-to-one -one technology for our students. Uh, so we're looking at ways to purchase even more to fill the gap uh, for any families that are, are missing um, Wi-Fi or broadband in their homes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. There are no more questions. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Nolan. Uh, for uh, the director's evaluation. Yes, it, every year we are required to evaluate Mr. Ballas, our, our one employee. And the, the, the two things that, that I wanted to tell you tonight, but this will be on the agenda uh, for July. One, his contract requires that he get an annual physical and he has completed that. And according to his doctor, he's able to continue. So that, that is one requirement that he has met. And the other requirement is that over the course of the 12 months, we complete certain policy monitoring reports that the board sets out and, and all of those policy monitoring requirements over the past 12 months have been completed by Mr. House and his team. So those are the two things that I had to tell you tonight, the, the actual um, formal re review will be next in, in July. So unless anybody has any questions about that, um, just do, let me know. This, this is Barry. We can move on to item number five, which is uh, county commissioner comments. At this time, are there any comments from county commissioners? I have no comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Anyone else? Okay, board members, are there comments? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is Charlie. Uh, was that was that Ms. Bryant again, the it county commission? It was. Ms. Bryant, yes. Just, just checking on her status and making sure she's okay and her family. I would just like. Thank you, I appreciate it. We're still, uh, my husband's still in the <coughs> hospital. <laughs> We know that know that you're in our prayers. Thank you. Absolutely. I just like to say uh, thank the staff for all the work that you're doing preparing uh, our kids to get back into class. I know that uh, when they do return, they're going to be receiving the best uh, possible service. Uh, so I just continue to keep on. I know this is a trying time, but you always stand to the task and meet and uh, come out above and ahead. Again, I just want to thank you personally. Thank you, Jimmy. Anyone else? Dan, uh, Mr. House? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I do want to uh, provide a, a brief uh, update in terms of reopening, uh, usually on a weekly basis. 
uh, like to remind us where, where things are. And uh, as we've told the public and told the board, uh, our goal is to, to have a, a, a most completed plan, uh, at, least a, at least a month before the start of the school year, which uh, right now is scheduled for August the 11th. Um, so by Friday, we'll have the, the comprehensive plan uh, for the public and, uh, and we'll provide that insight that covers, you know, transportation, you know, face masks, hand washing, a little bit of everything. But I will provide some insight because over the course of the last, uh, since Thursday, there have been some significant pieces of information that have come in. Uh, and I'll share with you what those significant pieces uh, look like. Uh, the first item that uh, has come in in the in the last last week is the the Gov is Governor Lee's uh, extended uh, emergency to uh, to August 29th. This um, uh, this extension really breaks down several different things. It also talks about us being able to continue um, our board meetings um, electronically. Um, there are certain things in here that also speak to. Uh, no more than uh, 50 uh, individuals, um, you know, coming together at a given time. Uh, I think you guys have seen this, but this is something that just came down the pipe uh, last week uh, that we've taken into account. Uh, another item that has come, uh, come to the table most recently is a, a document that's guidance from the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics. And this is probably the most significant guidance that we've seen yet that's specific to K-12 schools. And the American Academy of Pediatrics is a group of 67,000 doctors. And yesterday we had the opportunity to, uh, to interact with um, a board member from the American Academy of Pediatrics during our uh, commissioner's update. And uh, we were able to, to really get some insight. And I think the difference between this guidance and what we've seen from the CDC and anything else is that uh, they strongly advocate that all policy considerations for the coming school year should start with the goal of having students physically present. It goes into detail around uh, physical distancing measures, uh, pre-K kindergarten, elementary schools, secondary schools, special education, uh, physical distancing, uh, hallways, playgrounds. So you can see the specificity that it get in, gets into. So this document was very helpful. Um, again, it just hit the press on Thursday. So we're taking this to the table uh, to, to really take a close look at. Uh, another piece that, uh, that has been helpful to us is our, is our feedback from our, um, our, our associations, our teacher associations, uh, both CMCEA and PET uh, have been kept apprised on a weekly basis. And we've received additional feedback from both of them around um, the elements of the plan that have been out there already. Um, another very important piece that, uh, that just came down, um, came down the pipe as well is, uh, is of course our, our county uh, government. Uh, most recently, got, um, Mayor Durrett uh, rolled out a, uh, an emergency order uh, that spells out certain things. So all of these pieces of information that have come, come to fruition really in the last 72 hours, uh, 72 hours in terms of work days, um, have, have to be taken into account. Um, we also, uh, one, one last piece that came down the pipe today uh, was from Secretary Betsy DeVos that, uh, that speaks to uh, schools moving, moving back into session. Uh, so uh, all of the four or five documents that I just mentioned, we'll be taking those documents between now and updating our plan to ensure that it meets, uh, meets those needs. Um, our senior leadership team and our communicable disease team is in the process, like I said, of reviewing each one of these items and we'll make the necessary modifications accordingly as needed. My expectation is to close the loop on all aspects of the plan as soon as possible. And I expect that uh, an additional update to our public, um, to you as a board, uh, will happen on Friday. So we are excited to, uh, to really get to a, a place where, uh, where we're getting into, into some specific detail on Friday to give our public 
uh, ample time to, uh, to make the necessary adjustments that they might, might need to make as families uh, and for their children. Uh, so wanted to make sure that you guys were up to speed on it. We also, um, which is completely uh, on a whole different, whole different subject, um, we had moved uh, to our second phase of 50% of our staff uh, in, um, in, at Gracie Avenue and at Greenwood were, uh, were, were in our buildings and we, had, we were moving to 75%, but uh, being that uh, the most recent governor's um, orders as well as our mayor's orders, we've decided to hold at 50%. Uh, so wanted to make sure that you were up to speed even with the 50% of our staff here, we have added an additional day uh, that uh, these buildings are taking appointments. So we will be taking appointments on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays to ensure that our patrons have their needs met. Again, those, uh, those are by appointment only. So if people are out there that are looking to take care of business at the district level, it can be done, but it is being done uh, by, um, by, uh, by appointment only. Uh, the last thing that I will, uh, I will share is something that someone mentioned a little while ago, and that had to do with, um, I think, uh, Mr. Garland and, and, uh, and Charlie, you both mentioned this. Well, today, uh, July the 7th, Governor Lee is actually in DC with the, with the uh, Commissioner of Education, and they uh, received notification that uh, Tennessee would receive, to receive about $81 million in corona, coronavirus relief to grant uh, for K-12 schools. We don't know the details uh, as of yet in terms of what this will look like from school district to school district, uh, but we do know that uh, uh, CMCSS should qualify at some level uh, for some of these dollars. Uh, so uh, that is a, a significant plus, and we're looking forward to to hearing back and getting details possibly tomorrow uh, during our, our one o'clock commissioner, uh, commissioner update. The last thing that I wanted to mention is that um, uh, we have somebody that has an anniversary uh, today and that would be uh, Josh Baggett. Uh, Josh uh, has finished his, his 10th consecutive year uh, as, a, as a board member and serving in the Clarksville Montgomery County school system. And, and Josh, we want to publicly thank you. Um, I would normally uh, place this in your hand and, uh, and congratulate you, along with providing you with a, a nifty pin that, uh, uh, that speaks to uh, your commitment in the Clarksville Montgomery County School System. So Josh, thank you for, for your continued commitment, and we appreciate uh, your service um, to, uh, to the Clarksville Montgomery County School System. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Uh, Madam, Madam Vice Chair, that does conclude uh, my other business. If no other business, we declare this meeting adjourned. Have a good evening and a blessed week. You too. Goodbye. You too.